Okay, so hello, thank you guys for tuning in to our interview with Mark Messersmith today. Thank you for taking some time. Okay. Um, okay, so my first question is, most of your pieces combine sculpture and painting, so how do you decide what parts of the composition go to which? Well, the painting always starts first. You know, usually it starts with either an idea or an image, like yeah. it might be a bird or something that either I saw or maybe come across a photo in a field menu or something like that, and that'll sort of prompt an idea. Okay. And so, like, in this case, you know, I was... You know, all this interest around the Ivoryville woodpeckers had come up a few years ago, and the idea of them maybe still being out there in the swamps in, oh. in Arkansas someplace, and people out there looking for them. And, you know, the odds of them actually surviving out there are minuscule, but okay. I, I was sort of interested in the idea that there is this element of optimism in that sort of wish or quest to find those. Yeah. You know, because they haven't really been seen since the 1940s right. in the United States. So, um, you know, I like the idea that they could still maybe be out there when nobody was looking. So, yeah. you know, a weird sort of notion like that pops into my head. And, and you know, then I start working with the ivory built woodpeckers. Yeah. And then the rest of the painting just starts to sort of follow along. Mm -hmm. um, and the story kind of, and the narrative sort of develops from that. That's so I don't know where it's going to end. Sure, yeah. Not start. Um, yeah. I, I tend to have the same cast of characters, or more or less. Yeah. They kind of get recycled yeah. into everything. Yeah. You can always sign a logging the, truck. Or yeah, whatever. the Luna Moth. I yeah. don't know if there's one in here. Yeah, but, the butterfly yeah. takes its place. Yeah. Uh, Magnolia trees. Yeah. So it's kind of the same group of characters. They just, you know, they just bring on stage at different times. Yeah. So I do the painting, and when the painting's maybe about oh, 90, 95% done, you know, then I'll start with the box. If I do a box, you know, okay. I don't always do a box. Yeah. I'll, you know, do the box. Painting. And it's certainly just some same subject, same objects related to the painting. The box tends to read from left to right. It okay. gets progressively darker and, oh, okay. and um, you know, maybe pessimistic as you get to the right <laughs> side. Yes, okay, I see that. And then when the box is finished, um, then I pretty much frame it. And when it's framed at that point, then I kind of do the carving on top. Okay. So it, cool. you know, there is, it's not an intentional method or process, it's just one that seems to that? kind of naturally evolve. That's cool. Okay, and then, so like when you start your painting, do you do the background first or do you start with the foreground characters? I kind of start with large things first. Okay. So, you know, usually it's stuff in the foreground mm -hmm. that's large. And I, I kind of do the large things and I start the painting a little darker, color-wise, not, not, <laughs> not in terms of yeah. the mental okay. state, but, you know, start the painting a little darker. And then start moving okay. towards the smaller, integral things and then start lightening up the, sure. the painting. Okay, that's cool. Okay, and then for the sculptural elements, when did you begin adding those? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Because um, you know, I've been doing these things for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it started with an interest in altarpieces, medieval manuscripts, okay. and they look at books of hours, and most of the books of hours are tiny. Mm -hmm. And they're usually an element or a narrative of some, could be a saint or somebody. And they're just painted really, really incredibly beautiful. Mm -hmm. But you look closer at that image and it might be like the saint having their skin peeled off or their heads chopped uh, off. So there's something kind of fascinating about something that's incredibly beautiful mm -hmm. and often so incredibly upsetting at the same time. Okay. <clears throat> so I was interested in those manuscripts and they do tend to have decorative borders around the yeah. image. So at some point those borders, instead of a box here, it was a painted predella, that's the term. That's cool. Like yeah, a decorative yeah. border at the bottom of the painting. And at one point I thought, hmm, you know, why am I just painting this? I bet I could make this. Uh -huh. So okay. I just started making it and it was attached underneath and then eventually the box form started to evolve mm -hmm. where there were things in the box and mm -hmm. the box was physically attached to the painting. And that's more or less how the, the top element 
be okay. loud too. Cool. And, and there's something I'm interested in to some degree um, is folk art, certainly folks, folk art sculpture forms. I'm not that okay. fascinated with folk art painting, strangely enough. But I like, I like the, the naive folk art sculpture forms. Okay. So, you know, working with broken mirrors and, uh, and yeah. glitter. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't do yeah. anything with glitter unless they think you're a folk artist. Okay, okay. So, so I like those kind of materials. And at the same time, you know, working with relatively common things, you know, just pieces of wood mm -hmm. and paint and glitter and broken mirrors. You know, yeah. I've never been interested in the sort of temporalness of, of new media, you know, it comes and goes so fast. What was new last week mm -hmm. is old media this week. Yeah. So I like the idea of the old, old materials. Yeah. And yeah. the endless possibilities that those kind of provide. That's cool. And, and the idea that, you know, a human being did mm -hmm. A human being mm -hmm. would cut that out of saw. You yeah. Know? It's not like there was some button you push and sure. laser cut or yeah. Print yeah. It for you. Yeah, it's characteristic, like personality too. Yeah, right? yeah, that comes through the fingers and yeah. that just sure. through your brains. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, I like that. So in your paintings, you have this amazing scene and all these amazing colors. And, and one thing that I notice a lot is your use of super bright colors, almost neon <laughs> sometimes <laughs> about with, with uh, on the highlight areas. Mm -hmm. And so instead of doing the traditional white, and of course you have a little bit of that, but what made you start using the bright colors for highlights? Yeah, it's hard to say exactly, because a lot of things just evolve over time, but I think some of it came certainly moving to Florida. Oh. And, you know, but you're from Florida, so mm -hmm. you just see the same thing every day. I guess so. Just another bright hot. Sunny day. Yeah, yeah, okay. But I, I grew up in Midwest, so yeah. you know, you come down here and the sun is certainly different, certainly in the summertime. Oh, okay. And so that, in, in, in parallel to um, looking at a lot of you know, painters like John Singer Sargent mm -hmm. and what they do to make things seem to be luminous. It mm -hmm. might be complementary colors. Yeah. A lot of times you look at them closely and they have a lot of warm shadows on the bottom side of things, like the light bouncing off an object or bouncing off the ground and lighting mm -hmm. the object from underneath. Yeah. So I think I've been interested in the idea of that reflective light cool. and, and complementary colors trying to intensify each other. Yeah, yeah, I see that. And okay. some people think they look a little like uh, black velvet paintings at some point, you know, particularly okay. darker paintings. And I'm okay with that. Yeah. yeah. Who doesn't like black velvet paintings? I don't, I don't know what black velvet paintings are. <laughs> Maybe you don't know what black velvet paintings are. I don't. <laughs> uh, they're usually at Elvis Presley or Jesus or an Indian. Oh, okay. Okay, interesting. <laughs> or uh, Clint Eastwood or something. Okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, no, now I'm so disappointed. I don't know I'm I sorry. Feel, I don't know if I feel aged or, or <laughs> you know, generational thing. I don't know. Well, I'll you used to see it at gas stations. You know, you drive by and out the I corner don't know. of a gas station. You know what a gas station is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> out the corner of a gas station, there'd be a bunch of easels and somebody would be selling black velvet things. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll look it up. I don't know where I was, but I'll look. I'll look. <laughs> Okay, so um, something that a lot of people have been really curious about is how long a piece takes you to make. One of the big, big paintings. Yeah, I, I'm a pretty quick painter, and I, I usually do something on them every day when I've got mm -hmm. one working. I just kind of finish one up, so I'm not okay. really spending that much time working. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I'm working on one, it has been... A lot of times I work in the evening, mm -hmm. and sometimes I work in the morning. It just kind of depends where my brain is at at that moment. Sometimes there's a prominent painting, oh, I don't feel like trying yeah. to bang my head against that. Yeah. So you look for something else to do. For sure. And other times you go, oh, I can get in there, and I'm kind of excited about pulling something out. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but, you know, I, I probably spend, you know, three weeks or so wow. on, a, on a painting, okay. and that's getting into maybe 90% done. Wow. Okay. And the carving, that might take a day and a half. Or really? Something. Okay. And the box, you know, maybe two days or something. Wow. So, um, you know, that's why I got so many of these damn paintings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Yeah, <laughs> for sure. I feel that's quick. Uh, when I'm not working on a painting, mm. it feels sort of. It's not depressed, but it, it's like <laughs> melancholy. Like, oh man, I'm wasting time. Wow. Or, I'm not okay. doing aning. Yeah. Or I'm doing the same thing everybody else is by not doing anything. Mm -hmm. so, so I always have to have painting that I work. Cool. Okay. I tend to give you long answers. That's for, good. That's good. Simple, clear, straight. <laughs> okay. That's good. People, I think, are definitely interested. People, almost everybody's asked me. Yeah. Um. So you talked a little bit about um, how you uh, were born and you grew up in Missouri. So um, how did that inform your art journey or how the, the beginning of your art journey? You know, you know, again, these are like, like, like sort of core questions. I mean, mm -hmm. like, why are you the way you are? And, and those are good questions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's interesting to kind of look back on on it and, and think about it and realize where those pivotal points were and where yeah. you know all the options in the world started to be narrowed down to find something that mm -hmm. fortunately you're interested enough in doing. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I was never good in school, probably mm -hmm. because I never could figure out what I was doing there. Okay. And I wasn't very good at it. You know, I was not a good reader, I was mm -hmm. not a good memorizer. Yeah, sure, yeah. That's a big part and, of school. And when I was in school, that's the way we were yeah. taught to learn. You just yeah. memorize things the way every single person in that classroom mm -hmm. memorized them and you spit it out the exact same way. Yeah. So you can go off and get some factory job and do the exact same thing as yeah. everybody else around you for four years. Yeah. And I was never very good at again memorizing things mm -hmm. and the spelling. Um, <clears throat> but I, I enjoyed drawing. But it was never even a consideration as a career or, or vocation. It was just something I enjoyed doing. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the few things that somebody said, oh, that's pretty nice. You mm -hmm. did a good job. Of that. But it never sunk into my head to be an artist. And my folks, they had no conception of what yeah. art was about or involved. Mm -hmm. or, or, but they were supportive of it. That's nice, yeah. But they really didn't understand it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, I just kind of always fell back on that. Um, and then it wasn't until I went to community college that, you know, all of a sudden, you go, hmm, what do I want to do? What, do I, yeah. what am I interested in? Yeah. Before that, nobody cared what you were interested in. Mm -hmm. They said, oh, you're good. Yeah. So, you know, I, I took some more classes. I took some <clears throat> botanical botany classes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, and I still like plants and botany, but I didn't mm -hmm. want to be a botanist, I realized really mm -hmm. quickly. So I was taking a lot of art classes. <clears throat> and like every other college art kid, I thought, oh, man, maybe I better do some graphic design. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I wasn't interested in trying to please somebody else. Mm -hmm. So I was taking painting classes and, and I just kind of enjoyed doing that. And I was really naive, some might say dumb, but I was really naive about thinking about long-term future and career. Mm -hmm. So I just kept doing these things okay. and I enjoyed it. And then, you know, you get a, a body of work mm -hmm. and, you know, then from community college, you go, now what I do? So mm -hmm. I went to another two years of school and you know, you had enough artwork that you can show them, and you go, oh, there's potential here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, then you go through last two years of undergraduate school, and then you're kind of the same situation. And yeah. again, you got a body of work. You go, hmm, what do I do now? Yeah. A friend said, oh, why don't you go to graduate school? I said, sure. What the hell? I, mean, I don't know what it is, but I'll give it a shot. So I applied to um, graduate school, and kind of same thing, you know. You work opens doors for you, mm -hmm. and that was pretty much the case, you know, and, and that was in the, in the same way I got the job here at FSU, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't that because of my super mega brain and <clears throat> my bazillion years of experience on mm -hmm. the field, somebody looked at the work and go, oh, that's stuff you can pass on to 
students. And like, it's, a, you know, it's almost like my whole life has kind of been, um, <clears throat> you know, dependent on what these things mm. um, give to people. Okay, yeah. So they're like your spokesperson. That's cool. Okay, yeah. So it's like I never thought about art as a career. I didn't even think of teaching as a career. I just, yeah. It was just something I enjoyed doing because you're talking about yeah. something that you're really interested in <laughs> with somebody like you who's really interested in it. So yeah. it's like, I mean, how many times that happened in the real world? That's true. Outside of, of the arts. That's true. You know, talk yeah. about how much you hate the boss or how much you hate your job. Yeah. You know, those kind of conversations never come up when you're talking about students or other yeah. artists about the work. Yeah, lots of passion. Yeah, so it's a good way to make a living without mm -hmm. necessarily having to have a job. That's nice. But I always enjoy the, the students and working with them. Yeah. And kind of helping them to solve problems that they didn't even know they had. Mm -hmm. Okay. I like it, yeah. Um, and so you talked about, you know, how you started uh, studying botany as well. Mm -hmm. and but So you have a big garden, don't you? Well, it's not a big garden, but it is like a it's like a oasis kind of a place. Uh -huh. Yeah. And nobody nobody really goes back there. It's just some place that I go. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, I find it has a lot in common with the paintings. It's yeah, it's exactly. dense and packed with plants mm -hmm. and and you know lots of different shapes and tropical jungly. That's cool. And you know I tried block out the neighbor's houses. So yeah, it yeah. is kind of like... Jungle you know, world. Yeah, it really is. That's it's, cool. It's a, it's a hideaway from there as well. So I, I do like the plants, but again, the idea of not having much of a memory for those things. And I, can't, I don't bother if you try to remember the names of the plants. Sure. I might remember the common names, but you know, other than that. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I have no remorse about not being able to do it either. Okay. Do you use any of the, of the plants in your garden or your, the things that you see out there? Can you yeah, most of the things in the paintings are things that I've seen. Sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, other than obviously the Ivy the Woodpecker. You know, yeah, yeah. Seeing one of those, I'd be famous. <laughs> Especially if I got a photograph of it. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, things like the magnolias mm -hmm. and the goldfinches and yeah. the swallowtails. You know, most everything else are things that I've seen. Mm -hmm. um, the snakes. I used to get snakes in the bird feeder. And <laughs> I had this, oh, really? I had this, um, I guess it was a snake catcher. You know, it was a long thing. Yeah. A long time, so I just, Go out and get this snake out of the bird feeder oh. and put it in a box and then take it up and let it go on the pond. Oh. Um, so, you know, because I got tired of seeing the snake eating these little birds. Oh, yeah. You know, they were the snakes are so fast and it just oh. grabs it, wraps around it, and strangles it, and then oh. swallows it. So, wow. I felt, you know, I, I like to feed the birds, but I felt bad. I'm so like, you know, <laughs> bathing them for the snake. Yeah. So, you know, but like the snakes, um, you know, a lot of these. Paintings, there tends to be the same drawbridge. It was a bridge I was yeah. down on the way to St. Mark's Wildlife Reserve. Uh -huh. And it had a little drawbridge and a little house on the bridge where oh, the sure. bridge tender, I guess, yeah. would work it. And, but that's gone now. Mm -hmm. But I still put it in paintings. Okay. So, uh, you know, certainly the, the big herons and the bobcats and. Yeah. and the moths mm -hmm. and alligators. And Same the, characters. Yeah. yeah. They're not necessarily in my backyard, but yeah, there are sure. things that I've seen. See. Well, yeah, you also talk about how much North Florida mm -hmm. and the South impacts your work. Yeah, because so. I, I see it probably differently than maybe somebody like yeah. you. you know, yeah. Not because I'm so enlightened, but just mm -hmm. because I never grew up as a kid yeah. living with her all day yeah. long. Yeah. So, you know, I see these herons. And, it's not as normal. Know, well, that's pretty amazing because <laughs> uh, where I grew up, you know, there, were, there was nothing that Robins and blue jays and rabbits. And other okay. than that, there was no wildlife left. Oh, so it's okay. exciting to come down here and go, God, that stuff's still managing sure. to hang on. Okay, yeah. And, and that's really the gist of maybe what all these paintings are about is that these things are still hanging on out mm -hmm. there in, in, the, in the wild, in the wilderness, yeah. you know, here in Florida, at least mm -hmm. for a while. So there's yeah, always an element right. of human interaction. Yeah. And, yeah. And again, the animals, what they might be doing when nobody's watching. Mm -hmm. at oh, night cool. yeah, yeah. Or yeah, 
Yeah, I like that. Um, so you talk a little bit about um, some of your the inspirations of the painters that you look mm -hmm. to towards, um, like the uh, Johnson Heath, the Thomas Moran, the mm -hmm. Winslow Homer kind of mm -hmm. people. But um, are there any contemporary artists that you look at right now? Um, you know, there's so many good, great contemporary artists. You can almost just get overwhelmed sure. by it. And that's one of the, I don't know if it's a downside or the upside of, of living in Tallahassee, which is about as remote from the contemporary arts scene okay. as you can imagine. Yeah. You know, we don't even have a museum here yeah. that you can go look at in real significance. Mm -hmm. So you end up being fairly isolated. Yeah. Um, which is bad because it's nice to go see artwork. Mm -hmm. you know, I enjoy doing that. Yeah. But at the same time, um, it's probably easier not to be influenced by things. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I don't know uh, what the work would look like if I lived in New York City or something. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. Different. Yeah. Sure. And I'd probably be insane or something by now if I did live in New mm -hmm. York City. I mean, it's kind of place to visit. I just go out of my mind. Yeah. The noise and the hustle <laughs> and the congestion. Yeah. So, you know, in terms of the contemporary artists, um, you know, I like a lot of sculpture in a strange way. Mm -hmm. um, oh, it's hard to pick particular yeah. artists that I'm you know, really drawn to. Okay. Yeah. It's kind of like you know, your favorite ice cream, you know, that changes from day to day. Sure, your favorite color. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So even going back through our history, some days you even look at somebody like maybe Van Gogh and it's like, well, you're all fired up. And mm -hmm. the next time you look at him, like, it's not speaking to me quite like sure. it was before. Yeah. Okay. So it's about maybe your reception mm -hmm. as much as it is about you know, the significance of who these people are. Sure. Okay. Have you been to any good museums lately? Have you traveled? Oh, uh, yeah. With the pandemic, traveling sure. has been a little limited. Um, but we like to go to Washington, D.C., partly yes. because you can get a direct flight. Oh, okay. Again, Tallahassee is so isolated. Yeah. Unless you want to go through Atlanta or Miami mm -hmm. or Dallas. You can, I think you can still get a direct flight to Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. They've got lots of good museums. Yeah, and, and everything there is good. Mm -hmm. And there's a variety of things. You can go to the museums, and then you go to the botanical garden, mm -hmm. and you can go to the Native American Indian mm -hmm. Museum for lunch and yeah, lots eat of, food from all over lots the of culture. Yeah, all over the Native American continent. And I, 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 you know, I try not to think of art as being chronological. So mm -hmm. you know, I enjoy looking at older artwork. You know, it's just as viable and just as mm -hmm. insightful and just as yeah. Easy speaking to people as anything you can sure. or Maybe even more so, because a lot of art nowadays has become so self involved. It's always about the human, the human nature, the human condition, the human mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a whole world of things out there that art can be about. Sure. It yeah. doesn't always have to be about human beings. Yeah. Yeah. My human condition. I mean, you know, art is always sort of autobiographical. Mm -hmm. but, um, and, and there should be to some degree about where you live, who you are, what you've been exposed to. Yeah. But, and it seems like lately the art has gotten much more like self-obsessed or something. Mm -hmm. Okay. With the artist. Yeah. But that's the thing about Martin Johnson Heed and those painters, you know, they were living up in the Northeast and they'd come to Florida mm -hmm. and they'd see Florida and all, you know, pretty much like I did, you know, all sure. different eyes. You go, whoa, look at this place. It's, yeah. like, it's like, you know, paradise, particularly in those days. Yeah, untouched. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, you'd be taken with things and you go, yeah, paint that. Cool. Yeah, the exotic yeah. flowers and the plants and the swamps mm -hmm. and sunsets. Yeah. Okay. I don't even know if that's an answer to you. No, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that, that, that works. 
Any, any, any <laughs> Just so over us. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, a lot of your work talks about the human impact on the environment. So I'm, I'm curious just how you manage your fears or concerns or frustrations surrounding these environmental issues. And does your art work as kind of a, a calm like mm -hmm. aspect or is it kind of therapy for you or does it maybe stir up those feelings more? Yes, that's a good question. I and mean, that's almost getting to the gist of, of art or why an individual mm -hmm. does this. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> you know, it's not propaganda. I don't really yeah. expect I'm going to change anybody's perspectives on what they think about the environment. Yeah. You know, there's other better ways to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's certainly a concern of mine. Yeah. And then, and that's again kind of obviously what the paintings are about that, that point between you know, the survival of the creatures, the planet, and this point we're on where we can make a decision to go the other way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you're probably right, it probably does keep me a little bit sane. Yeah. You know, because you can go. Crazy worrying sure. about every single thing. I mean, yeah. you know, today in the news, they finally listed 20 uh, animals that they officially labeled extinct. You know, one of them was the aggregate woodpecker. So, you know, so those kind of statistics and the news stories can make you crazy, but at the same time, they, they provide you fodder to paint. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I guess I'm going to paint that because yeah. that bothers me so much. Mm -hmm. But You know, what Susan and I have done is, is we've established a will where, you know, all the property, all the stocks, all the stuff we've accumulated, mm -hmm. all the paintings, all the investments, um, is willed to the Nature Conservancy. Mm -hmm. So 90% nice. so of, of everything that we've accumulated, the time we're done accumulating mm -hmm. things, goes to the Nature Conservancy, 10% goes to it. <laughs> so yeah, you know, I, I it's maybe another little bit of a catalyst to make paintings and, and yeah. get them out there, and, and hopefully they become of some value where that money can be sort of put back into the subjects of yeah. what those paintings. Are. Yeah. So um, you know that that makes me feel good. Like, yeah. There is the possibility of that. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah. it's the way the world is. I mean, money is the only thing that can yeah. get things done. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to talk about the environment, you just better buy some place for these animals, for these mm -hmm. forests to stay mm -hmm. alive. Yeah. And then, um, it seems like the nature and service is good at that or relegating important pieces of property mm -hmm. to save and sell off other ones. That, yeah. So, so. Okay. It's a complicated world. Yeah. And it's, it's a yeah. depressing world when you start reading. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's good. It's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, finally, my last question is what do you want people to take away from this exhibit? Um, I want them to like the paintings. I suppose sure. that's what most artists do. You know, I don't paint for other people, mm -hmm. but I hope that other people like the way I'm presenting the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the paintings are structured in a way that most anybody can get something out of. Yeah. You know, they're not complicated in terms of the narratives. Mm -hmm. There might not be a clear straight line of narrative, but there's always something going on that each individual can maybe come up with their own narrative yeah. solution in the painting, which I'm yeah. fine with. Um, even the boxes, you know, children like that because it's at their size. Yeah. They look at those, they like the little toys, you know, <laughs> scale and things. So I, I sort of like that, that or hope that a broad range of, of backgrounds and people's insights can get something from them. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And then maybe a little bit of environmental concern sure. kind of creeps in. Yeah. Well, it gets people thinking, I think. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to, you know, they're not propaganda. Sure. Like, do sure. this or you yeah, know, yeah. Hell, or do not do this and the world will fall apart. Um, I think most people at some degree know that anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're always about paintings. Paintings are always about paintings first. Okay. It, you know, if it's paint on a canvas, hung on a wall, it already has the history, the baggage of All most of art. Okay, yeah. So it has to be, hmm. well, it can't escape that world, people's mm -hmm. expectations of a painting. Well, that's mm -hmm. a painting. Well, you know, so you got that. And, and I sort of like that boundary that it's a given that you're working or starting with. Yeah. But, you know, I think that's what compels me to do yeah. weird things. Mm -hmm. You know, what can I do different? Than sure. People's expectations of just a normal thing. Yeah. It's quite a lot of, I mean, art history to work from. So, yeah. It's great inspiration. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Bella, for the good question. Sure. Of course. And thank you. Thank you for tuning in and listening. And we will be back, uh, I guess, in November for another artist interview. Okay. <laughs>